you today about uh, plasmonic organic photovoltaics, or controlling light at the nano scale for improved, uh, inexpensive solar cell devices. My name is Daniel Jacobs, um, and I work in the lab with Dr. Ling Zhang in the material science department, and my co-PI is Dr. Jennifer shoemaker Perry in the chemistry department. Um, a little background of myself, I went to undergrad at the University of Pittsburgh where I studied chemical engineering, and now I came here into the material science program. Um, so, I know that you guys are interested in engineering, what that entails, so you might be interested in what exactly is material science engineering. Um, it's a good question, I ask myself that a lot, coming from chemical engineering. Um, the term material science is pretty broad. Um, this, uh, on the right is a picture of what uh, I found on the internet of the material science tetrahedron. So it kind of does a pretty good um, job of showing the different parts of material science in one small picture, but in general, material science is pretty simple. It's just that it's the science of materials. So these can be anything from inorganic materials like oxides, metals, semiconductors, magnetic materials, composites, organic materials like polymers or small molecules, and even biomaterials where you can study proteins, viruses, DNA. Um, and the engineering part comes in with processing these materials. So you can use different techniques to process them, uh, grow crystals, you can deposit thin films, you can do post-process engineering. But the key to material science is um, using both of these materials and a specific process to accomplish a specific goal or a property. And these properties can be anything from structural, electrical, thermal, optical. Um, pretty much anything that you could study can be encompassed in this umbrella of material science engineering. And just so you guys have an idea of what I'm going to be talking about, um, my project kind of focuses on metals and organic polymers, semiconductor polymers, um, and I deposit using thin film techniques, and I'm studying and optimizing for optoelectronic uh, uh, properties. So before I can get into photovoltaics, um, I'll, I need to give a brief introduction to exactly uh, to how light and matter interact. So as you guys probably know, light is just electromagnetic radiation. It's waves of electric and magnetic fields um, oscillating through space. And so the defining characteristic is what's called the wavelength, or the distance between the crest or the troughs of the wave. Um, if you change the wavelength, you can get drastically different properties. So if you have a wavelength that's on the order of 10 to 100 meters, you can get radio waves. Or if you go down to wavelengths that are on the scale of the nucleus of an atom, you can get gamma rays. And how these interact with matter very drastically because the shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy it carries. Um, what we know as light is a tiny little sliver right in the middle there. Um, and uh, if you look at the light coming from the sun, which is the electromagnetic waves that we deal with on a daily basis, you can see that uh, the sun's energy peaks right about at the um, wavelength of visible light, what we know as visible light. Although there is a lot of infrared light um, coming in, but most of the photons coming from the sun has to do with the visible light. And that's why a lot of the properties that we work with with materials um, is where we're studying at, at that range of visible light. So light and matter can interact in different ways um, and also interact differently depending on the energy that it carries. So but simply, light can transmit through a material, like a window, um, it can reflect off material, like most metals. It can refract through the material, which is really transmission, but uh, that changes with different, um, different materials. Or it can be absorbed within the material. These first four are all intrinsic properties of the material. So if you have a material, a bulk material, you're going to have a defined transmission, reflection, refraction, and absorption. Um, and then just one other way that it can interact is if you change the surface, if you make it really rough, you can actually get scattering. Um, so it's reflection, but into many different uh, directions instead of a single reflection. So the important thing to remember is that while most, uh, you can have light matter interaction that is intrinsic with the material, but if you change the material process in a certain way, you can change the interaction. So it's both intrinsic and extrinsic. Um, so photovoltaics um, 
our solar cells, and this is taking the energy of light and, and turning it directly into electricity. So these use semiconductor materials, um, and a semiconductor is defined as having what's known as a band gap, where there is no electron energy allowed. So if this is the um, electrons in the ground state energy, they're attached to the atoms. Um, and they are not allowed here, but if they're given enough energy, they can go into the conduction band where they're allowed to move freely throughout the entire material and conduct electricity. Um, semiconductors have a band gap that is on the order of about the energy that light carries. So if you hit a semiconductor with energy greater than this band gap, you can excite an electron into the conduction band, and now this can go and move freely throughout the, the material. But eventually, that will drop down um, and give off a photon and recombine. So you have to do something special with the material. If you dope one side, say it's silicon, if you dope one side, you can change the energy levels and you can cause charge separation. So you separate this positive charge here, where the electron used to be, and this negative charge. You separate those charges. If you add contacts and run a circuit, you can get electricity and, and you, you can uh, use the power. Um, so that's the basic understanding of how photovoltaics work. I'm working with organic semiconductors. These differ a little bit than inorganic semiconductors like silicon. Silicon is a single material, and so you can do things like band bending, which is seen there. It, it smoothly um, separates the charges. But in organic semiconductors, these are discrete molecules. It's not a single crystal of material. So what you have to do is you have to add um, two different types of materials. You have to have uh, a donor and, a, and an acceptor material. Um, so this here, this donor material is a polymer, or it's a plastic. And this is a, the acceptor material, the electron carrier is a fullerene, so it's just carbon, essentially. Carbon is a fullerene, um, it's a Buckminster fullerene, it's called, it's 60 carbons um, in this soccer ball shape. So the unique thing about organic semiconductors is that, it's, while it's um, not as efficient because it's, no, it's not a single material, you can work with these in solution. So you can dissolve this polymer and this molecule in solution. So you don't have to grow a single crystal of silicon, but you can simply mix these two solutions and let the solvent dry. And now you have this semiconducting, act semiconducting active layer, this PN junction, um, where you have phase separated donor and acceptor. So this is what drives that separation of charges. So if you put this into a solar cell architecture, what you have um, here is the active layer, and this is the cathode and the anode. <clears throat> and so if you shine light, you create charges that separate at the interface between this donor and acceptor um, material. And um, so this is great, you can get devices this way. One problem though, uh, you might notice, so if you create charges here, right here, this, uh, this electron won't be able to make it to the cathode. So this electron will get trapped and recombine. So this is just a general problem with these, what are called bulk heterojunction solar cells. Just by simply mixing them, it's easy to process, but you get a lot of impurities and you can extract, extract all the charges. One way around, around this is to make this extremely thin. So this active layer is usually about 100 nanometers um, thick. That's about 1,000 times thinner than a single strand of hair. So very, very, very thin. Uh, this helps to extract the charges much more efficiently. But if you think about it, if you have a bulk piece of material which is thick, you're going to get a lot of absorption. These materials can absorb very well. Um, but no matter how well they can absorb, if you make it really, really, really thin, you're going to decrease the amount of absorption because you have less material for it to absorb and you increase the amount of transmitted light. And so this results in a decrease in current because you absorb less light um, and the performance goes down. And this is a ma major limiting factor in, um, in these organic photovoltaics. So this is where the field of plasmonics comes in. You might not have heard of this um, field, but it's, um, the, the idea of plasmonics is to trap the light and, and concentrate it. So if you have a, a piece of metal, a bulk metal, it's so large that it's much larger than the wavelength of light. 
So visible light is between 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers. So if you have a metal that's much larger than that, um, the electron gas of the metal, which is, defines a metal, it has three mobile charges throughout the whole metal, that's why it conducts. So this electron gas will simply reflect this light off of the bulk metal, and that's why metals are shiny and you get um, good reflection off of that, off of the bulk metal. But if, again, if you make this much, much smaller, and now it's on the order of, um, its size is much smaller than the wavelength of light, um, you get a different mechanism. So this electron gas of the structure is now, the whole structure of electron gas is experiencing a uniform electromagnetic field. Because remember, light is nothing more than oscillating electromagnetic fields. So if this is smaller than the wavelength, the whole structure is experiencing a uniform field. And what you get is oscillation of the electron gas with the, um, as the, the electromagnetic field passes uh, through it. When you have oscillating negative charges, you also have oscillating positive charges, and this defines a oscillating dipole, um, which is how you create electromagnetic fields. So essentially this creates what's called a near field. It's a very intense um, electromagnetic field very close to the surface of this particle. So you can take this light that's passing over it, which might be diffuse, but by creating this electromagnetic near field, you're creating a high intensity light. So it's essentially concentrating the light very close to the surface of the particle. Um, if you have a spherical particle like this, you're going to have a single wavelength with which this is going to resonate. It um, depends on the wavelength of light which, uh, um, for, for how this is going to resonate. And also the size of this is going to change um, which wavelength is going to resonate. But if you have a spherical particle, you're only going to resonate at a single wavelength. And if you're trying to capture a large wavelength of light and concentrate it within the solar cell so that all of the light can be um, used to uh, for increased absorption, you need to have more than one wavelength. Um, so what I'm working with is something called nanocrescents. This is a uh, asymmetric shape, so it's no longer a sphere, but it's a crescent shape. What this means is that if you take light that's polarized along this direction, so the electro, uh, electromagnetic field is oscillating in this direction, electrons are going to oscillate from tip to tip and you're going to get one wavelength of light, one amount of energy is going to cause this oscillation. If you go in the other direction, you're going to get electrons oscillating from the tip to the backbone, and that's another energy of light that's going to cause that oscillation. So what you do is you create more pathways for this, res um, this resonant process to happen, and you can essentially um, concentrate more light to within the surface of this nanocrescent. So I make these nanocrescents um, with something called nanosphere template lithography. It's a large area process, which is good for these inexpensive solar cells. Um, what I do is I take nanospheres, uh, polystyrene spheres, which are about 100 nanometers in diameter, and I place them on a surface. And then I deposit gold at an angle to the surface, and so some of the gold gets trapped underneath and then I etch this gold uh, normal to the surface, and what's left, um, which is masked by the, the sphere, mm -hmm. is a nice little crescent shape. Pretty simple, um, pretty simple technique, um, but it's actually very, uh, um, very useful. So when I study the light interaction, I in fact see that if I have light polarized in the short axis of this crescent, I get one wavelength of light, which is enhanced. And then if I have light polarized in the long axis, I have a second wavelength of light, which is enhanced. If I have unpolarized light, this is an average of these. And you get a large, um, a large range of light, which is now concentrated at the surface. As opposed to if I had a sphere, I would have just a single peak, and that's it. Another thing to note is that um, Again, the intrinsic interaction with light uh, is important here. If I change the size of these nanocrescents, I can change the wavelength of light. So if I make this nanocrescent larger, the, um, 
the, the, the light will go more towards the red, towards lower energy, where if I'm making smaller, they will go towards the blue light. So I can, I can tune the properties of this light um, just by changing the size and the, the shape of these nanocrescents. So essentially what I want to see is if I put these nanocrescents on top of my anode, right below my active layer, this light should concentrate to within the active layer, and that helps me create more charges, and I can create a larger current. So that's the goal. So here are some preliminary results. I'm still pretty early in this, in this research, but this is an SEM of the, uh, the nanocrescents which I made. As you can see, it's a pretty uniform distribution of size, and, and it's nicely dispersed on the surface. Um, and you can see the nanocrescent shape. They're not perfect, but they're, they're pretty good. Um, and by studying uh, their interaction with light uh, beneath the active layer, I see here that the absorption of the active layer is increased throughout the whole absorption profile of the active layer, where the black line is without any nanocrescents, and the red and green are with nanocrescents. And you can see that the absorption increased. Um, and what I should see with that is a larger current because the, the more light I absorb, the more charges I create. And in fact, this is exactly what I see, um, where uh, the blue line is without any nanocrescents. This is the amount of current right here coming from my device. Whereas this, with the nanocrescents, it is a significant increase in the current that I'm able to extract from the device. So um, I'm going to, I, I can assume, but I still have to do more tests to make this, um, to prove this, but I'm going to assume that it's the absorption of light which is causing the higher current coming from um, my device. So in summary, I'm working with organic photovoltaics because they are very cheap and easy to process. And this is very important since silicon solar cells are pretty expensive. The inorganic solar cells are, are expensive because you have to you have to make these single crystals, careful processing techniques um, to make them. But these organic photovoltaics are very cheap because all you have to do is put it in solution, mix them, drop cast them, and let them dry. And that's all you need. Um, however, because of uh, just intrinsic um, recombination events, you get limited absorption uh, from op like optically thin active layers. So that's why I'm, I'm working with plasmonics and I'm able to manipulate the light at the nanoscale and concentrate it to within this very thin active layer um, to increase the, the light absorption. Um, and again, these plasmonic structures that I'm working with are unique because I can simply change the uh, shape and size and I can drastically change which light I want to concentrate. So I can pick any, basically any wavelength of light that I want to concentrate. Um, and so far, I've, I've had some promising results. I've had an increase of two of the current density, um, but optimization is still needed. So um, with that, I'd like to thank my group, the design group, especially Li Gui Li, Li, an ex-postdoc. My group taught me everything about solar cells, and Ben, who's a current PhD student, and the rest of my group, who is seen here on top of the mountain. And the Jennifer Shoemaker Perry group, um, especially Kara Barnes, an ex uh, master's student, and Mark Swartz, a current PhD student. Of course, the funding that paid me to do this research, and my, uh, my PI's affiliation with the U Star and the Institute. So, with that, I thank you, and I welcome any.